So shall we? Oh. So welcome. Welcome. First and foremost, I want to thank Sandra for reaching out to me um, um, and asking me to be a part of a union tradition. I'll talk a little bit about, for me, why it was so important to be able to, to do this. So Sandra, I want to thank you, um, as well as Robin, um, for, for inviting me to this space. Uh, my name is Michael Robertson, and I am a graduate of Union Theological Seminary. I have been doing public health for the past 27 years, first in Camden, New Jersey, through the Camden City Board of Education, and then I moved to New York City, particularly doing HIV prevention with Black and Brown LGBT folk, and more specifically with the House Ball Walden community. Um, in 2008, uh, 2010, actually, I decided to go back to seminary, went back to graduate school and to go to Union Theological Seminary because I wanted to put public health in conversation with theology because it was my assertion that the theological abomination narrative had direct impact on health disparities, particularly impacting Black gay men. Ergo, you tell people that the very essence of who they are is antithetical to God, and then expecting to engage in protective factors over their body made no sense. So I wanted to be able to shift that narrative. And so I was blessed enough to, to, to come to Union. And I, so I say this to say that I have to give grace to a couple of people before we begin. Part of the Black tradition is to be able to give gratitude to those who laid the foundation for you. And first is that absolutely brilliant Black woman who, are, who I called and Ken would say the same thing to Rock and my Gibraltar, who's no longer there, but Dean, Yvette Wilson Barnes, because if not for her, I mean, not for her, not only for myself, but for many of us, I mean, Union would have been a rockier place. I was blessed my, my very first semester to have Bishop Yvette Flunder, someone who I call my mama now. And so for me, being able to be in the space with such greatness um, uh, uh, was absolutely an utter blessing. And then I was blessed um, to also have Dr. James Cohn even though uh, there was some contention, he really, really pushed this notion of me looking at a, a ballroom in this sort of Black liberation theological lens. And then my second year, <laughs> uh, one of the per people who have had the biggest impact on my consciousness was a woman, is a woman named Dr. Ebony Marshall Turman, who introduced womanism to me and gave me a language to codify that which I came to do. Um, and the last two professors that I mentioned someone else um, as I back into it um, that I wanna talk about is I was blessed. I know everyone who ever had him was blessed to have Dr. Cornell West. Um, he was my professor in my very last semester. And it is in many ways, this talk that we're going to engage in today that I'm gonna use Dr. West and Dr. Ebony Marshall determined to lodge this thing around ballroom being a black prophetic fire, but, but, but using it as a black trans woman's this theological discourse. So I'm gonna give credo to Dr. West and Dr. Gary Dorian, who was my advisor, who just, uh, Dr. Dorian would just allow you to do that in which you wanted to do. Um, and he absolutely advised me and to be able to look at the ethical formation of not only ballroom, but also the work that we were doing around Black gay men. And the last person I would want to mention is my great, great colleague, sister friend, uh, union graduate, Dr. Charlene St. Clair, who not only uh, gave me language around sort of the politics of community organizing, but was just like Dr. Dean Yvette Wilson was my rock at Gibraltar. I thank Union for that um, and allow me to be in this space. I do want to contextualize and set the stage and why I, I want uh, why this talk is so necessary. I'm thinking about last year, the beginning of 2020, I was asked to be in dialogue by um, a woman named Dr. Jackie Lewis, is also a Union graduate, a womanist, who is the pastor of Middle Collegiate Church the very first woman in African-American to be a pastor in their 300 year history. And she asked me to be part of their annual conference that, that had to shift from a face-to-face -to, -face to virtual because of COVID. And so I said, absolutely yes. And asked me to bring along my great colleague and sister friend, uh, uh, Dominique Jackson, who plays Electra on Pose. 
um, to talk about ballroom and what does ballroom have to say in this moment. And I thought about that and I thought about what it meant for all of us to have to take a global pause. The universe of God was asking us to all take a pause at one time globally and to ponder on three propositions. The first one was a philosophical proposition, which is who do we desire to be? That in this moment now we have the choice to choose who we desire to be and we should make that choice informed wisely. Who do we desire to be? The second one was, is a theological proposition, which is how do we desire to love and love more expansively? That in the work of our everyday living and even the work that we do, that we're engaged in and we're called to do, that if love, as, as James Baldwin has put it, it's not the ethical formation, then it is moot. So how do we love more expansively? And the third one is a political one, which is how do we politically organize? How do we move politically away from organizing around the right not to die and move towards the right to live? Those are two separate trajectories. Oftentimes, marginalized people have been told that you have a right not to die. And so we're living not to die versus understanding we have the divine right to live. And so I wanted, I wanted to, to contextualize because one of the things that we're going to talk about, um, how, what ballroom has to say in this moment around those things. So I want to open with a quote from Dr. Cornel West. And I know that oftentimes in chapel we use Bibles, but I'm going to use one of my Bibles, uh, Dr. Cornel West's book, uh, The Black Prophetic Fire. I'm going to open with a quote um, that he wrote in very beginning of his introduction, and he asked the question, are we witnessing the death of Black prophetic fire in our time? Are we experiencing the demise of the Black prophetic tradition in present day America? Do the great prophetic figures and social movements no longer resonate in the depth of our souls? Have we forgotten how beautiful it is to be on fire for justice? These are some of the questions he said he wrestled with in this book. And this, in many ways, is how I'm going to situate this talk. And as part of the Black prophetic tradition, we'll begin this with the musical selection. Um, so I want to open it up. We're going to do it. Since this is virtual, we're going to try to, to maneuver two kinds of way of doing this. First, with a selection from my great friend, the Reverend Ken Austin Jr. And then I'm going to do a video, a lip sync performance of a trans woman in Princess Jane who's no longer here. And let me contextualize why I'm absolutely sharing that piece. For me, um, growing up in, our, in the Black LGBT community, lip sync performance were always done by trans women. We, at that time, we called them drag performances only because we didn't have the language, the utility to say trans or to use trans. And these performances were always on a Sunday. Those that's not accidental because it was a day that we felt we were systematically pushed out of church. So the club became our church. And the trans woman lip singing was very symbolic to the black woman you went to hear sing every Sunday. Using the language of Dr. Ebony Marshall Terman about the black woman's body being a hermeneutics, a way to contextualize pain and joy and desire of a community that was wrestling with so many things. But oftentimes, uh, um, one of the things that I think we have done so much so as like we did black women in the church with black trans women is that we use them as spectacles to perform without asking really be understanding of their full humanity. And so I'm going to show a performance of her, Princess Jeanne, performing at a, a, a play exhibition that we did. We had no idea that her body was, uh, 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 she was wrestling with so much pain because she was struggling with cancer. She winds up passing maybe a year and so change. Um, and so I show this oftentimes as a reminder of sort of the, the brilliance of black trans women in our community. So we'll do that, we'll do Ken Olsen Jr. first, and then we'll go to Princess Jeanne, and then we will come back and hear the word. Soon I will be done with the troubles of this world, the troubles of the world, the troubles of this world. I know soon I will be done 
with the troubles of the world. I'm going home to live with God. Soon I will be done with the troubles of this world. The troubles of the world, the troubles of this world, oh, soon I will be done with the troubles of the world. I'm going home to live with God. to say but ancestors to be in this space with us i thank you can you absolutely know how much i love you and i thank you for that and as as we watch this next video all the ancestors particularly of this month who've laid down foundation for us to be here let's remember them
It won't play. Oh, Jesus. It's okay. It would play. I'll, I'll try to play it at the very end. So I want to begin with a quote from Zornir Hurston, who once said that black women are the mules of the earth, always trampled on over and over and over again. I oftentimes say that black women are situated as the Christ in our community, self-sacrificed, always giving always holding up whole families, whole communities, even giving to her oppressor's children when it oftentimes is nothing left for her. But the black cis women particularly are the mules of the earth. Then black trans women are lodged somewhere between Howard Thurman's notion of the disinherited and Franz Fanon's notion of the wretched of the earth and still somehow they make a way out of no way. And that way for me, and so many of us have been ballroom. So I'm gonna talk about sort of the history of the house ball community, place it in some ways through this lens of a black prophetic fire. Uh, I'm going to, to do this sort of chronology uh, and connect dots and then talk about borrow from womanism as I was a student of womanism and talk about what I call the six tenets of ballroom history. It is absolutely true that if not for slavery, if not for the Emancipation Proclamation, if not for Black Reconstruction and its dismantle, if not for the rise of Jim and Jane for racism and the rise of lynching, if not for Black folk moving from the Southern part of the United States to the Northern part looking for new spaces of freedom and Harlem becomes the new Black Mecca. If not between 1919 and 1931, the creation of an artistic political movement called the Harlem Renaissance. If not for the black church creating a three decade campaign to get rid of black queers in Harlem, there were three ways that black queer, queers congregated, beauty salons, rent parties and drag balls. And drag balls become the, it, the largest political, but I oftentimes say theological movement of a people who were homeless in the new home in contestation to the black church around a theology of mattering. So my first tenet of ballroom history is that it first and foremost is a black trans womanist theological discourse because it creates itself out of the ethos of black trans women creating a theology of mattering of a people who've been told that they are the antithesis to God that they don't have access to God. But after World War II, where other cities become blacker, Detroit, DC, Philadelphia, Baltimore, these drag balls migrate. And so in fact, black publications, particularly some of them would publish some, uh, some of the pictures of drag balls. But in 1967, Black trans woman in Crystal Labasia. She resists racism over and against the drag ball circuit, uh, critiquing it on not only race, but colorism because white or light, very, very light skinned trans women were winning and she marches off stage in protest. There was an, a guy named Phil Black, who was the only African American drag performer who had a Screen Actors Guild card. And Phil Black whispers, if you will, into Crystal's ear, this is my reimagination, and to Crystal's ear that we should go back to an old Harlem drag, black drag ball circuit. And in 1968, 
the morphing, you begin to see the morphing from drag ball and drag ball just meant trans women participated to the political or theological construction of houses. And the very first house was created in 1968 called the House of La Beja, named after Crystal. And there were five particular trans women, I call them a terrible five, um, um, in many ways, who we call the modern, the mother of the modern house ball community. I call them freedom fighters, if you will. Pepe La Beja, Dorian Corey, Avis Pindargus, Duchess Luong, and Paris Dupree. So the construction from drag ball to house ball allowed ballroom to be a black freedom movement. So the second tenet of ballroom history is that it not only is a black trans woman it's theological discourse, but it's a black freedom movement because it migrates across the country in contestation to a systemic oppression, just like all freedom movements, creating political and theological formulations around mattering. 1973, Gay men begin to participate and you saw the family structure, this kinship structure, mother, father, children, in many ways responding to so many young folk being ostracized, not only from the families of origin racially, a black sense, but one's own family of origin. And so these houses become families, taking in folk, having to take care of folk. In relationship though also, to other art political movements that was happening at the time. So the third tenet of ballroom history, that it is an art collective and it's a political movement, just like hip hop in 1973, just like salsa in the late 60s, just like the New Yorkian poet movement. Harlem was his movement of art collecting itself, politicizing itself, organizing itself because it felt disenfranchised. And in many ways, a prophecy prophetic lens that was what was to come. This what was to come was 1981. In fact, we are in the 40th anniversary of that which we call AIDS. 1981 was the very first communication of this rare cancer that we call GRID, Gay Related Amino Deficiency Syndrome, and Ronald Reagan was our president. Ronald Reagan represented a shift in the Republican landscape from ultra conservatism to neoliberalism, this connection to global capitalism, the deregulation of banks, the cutting of social programs. And he was hyper, hyper quiet, if you will, about AIDS. In fact, he only whispered it through his lips one time. We'll talk about that one time. But as that happened in 1984, crack entered the, 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 the scheme of things you had a, a both AIDS and crack converging, convene, convening on black and brown bodies. But black community made a political and intentional decision to deal with crack. Its assertion was that if black gay men particularly were getting AIDS, the black gay men deserved it. It was God's way of getting rid of perversion from the earth and it was, it was black gay men's punishment. And house ball has to continue to create itself in response to that. There's a wonderful book by a black lesbian called uh, Kathy Cohen called The Boundaries of Blackness. And she, she dichotomizes the political breakdown during the AIDS crisis. And her assertion was that as black, black community made this decision to deal with crack, it allowed black gay men first to get infected and die and then black women to get infected and die. In fact, it didn't change our mindset and our, and our organizing around AIDS until Magic Johnson uh, became infected. But here is an interesting thing around resistant discourses, that even in resistant discourses, there's hegemony, that even as black gay men had to begin to organize itself because it felt that black community was, was not addressing its concerns. It felt in a larger gay community that it was not addressing its concerns. So they began organizing in such a way in 1986, but made a political and intentional decision to ostracize the ballroom community out of AIDS organizing. And part of this assertion, right, as black folk talked about gay men around homophobia, the larger black, black gay community talked about ballroom around classism that was not worthy to be saved. In fact, 
Kathy Cohen's notion of the boundaries of blackness means who's worthy to be saved in black community. So in 1986, as black gay men are organizing, ballroom began to migrate, house ball migrated for the very first time, house ball, not drag ball, out of New York City into Washington, D.C. in 86, and in 1989 to Philadelphia in 1990 to Baltimore. The 1990s is a very interesting time for ballroom because these two emblematic events happened at the same time, both through the, the lens of white women, the documentary Paris is Burning was done and uh, screened Jenny Livingston is the filmmaker, a white cis lesbian, and Madonna did a song and video called Vogue. Part of the brilliance, if you will, part of the dialectical tension of Paris is Burning that is artistically wonderful, but it's culturally exploited. So Madonna Vogue took the cultural production of ballroom, capitalized off it, and even used ballroom bodies as a way to capital. And she gets credit for Vogue. In fact, two black women before Madonna had Vogue in their videos, Queen Latifah and Jodie Wiley in 1987. But as she nationalized it, Ballroom began to then use Vogue as a way to organize and create other spaces of freedom around the country. So the fourth tenet of Ballroom is that it uses Vogue and performance as an organizing tool. So the, the, the mid 90s, she began to see the explosion of ballroom communities around the country in Chicago, in Orlando, Florida, in Miami, Florida, in the West Coast, in Los Angeles, in Orlando. And we get, began to go overseas. In fact, a young gay man at the time, who's a black trans woman now, who's transitioned, moved out of Paris, France, in the early 90s, because there was no black and gay community comes to New York City looking for community, goes to the piers and on Christopher Street looking for community and finds ballroom, winds up joining a house, stays in New York for about five, six years and then moves back to Paris and creates the black ballroom community which winds up creating the larger black gay community. The ballroom begins to organize itself around performance and vogue as a political and as a theological formulation using the cultural production. Well, we began to witness something that took us aback, if you will. As we began to see the numbers around HIV decline with white gay men, partly because in 1996 was the, 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 the invention of what we call the triple pill therapy by Merck Pharmaceuticals and white gay men's numbers become, began to decline and they became undetectable, but black gay men's continues to decrease. I, I saw a, a, a particular study in 2005, one of the things that came out of a study that was done in five cities around HIV prevalence was that 46% of black gay men between the ages of 23 and 29 was HIV positive, 46%. So as the numbers of HIV were inclining, the deaths were, declining, except for with the house ball community. We began to see a return of this old way of death around HIV or complication to AIDS. And so what ballroom had to wind up doing is creating interventions to take care of itself. Right? Using sort of the radicality of cultural production or political organizing grounded in the house wall community to address its concerns. And so we created some things to respond to those things. And so the fifth tenet of ballroom history is that it is a radical pedagogy. Creating interventions to take care of itself. An intervention suggested one is entering in from a power over intra says community can take care of itself. And some of these things that we wind up creating was this national leadership initiatives like House Lives Matters, like the Arbor Santana Ballroom Freedom School, and in many ways, uh, if not for union, uh, some of these things would not have been able to be created. But the last thing I wanna say about ballroom in relationship to these five tenets is that it's absolutely a spiritual formation, absolutely. They use the language of Bishop Yvette Flunder around the radical inclusivity that is absolute community, that even though it has experienced, been confronted with being ostracized from multiple communities, it is a community that embraces all. It is a community absolutely having to take care of itself 
and having oftentimes to address concerns even for other communities. So one of the beautiful things that I think about having this sort of conversation, particularly at Union, because Union has a history of being in relationship, of being in dialogue with those things that are happening in the world. Union absolutely gave me the ability, absolutely gave me the language, absolutely helped me to have the courage to be able to address the concerns of ballroom in this theological way. The fact that we are 40 years in to the, to the global pandemic of HIV, in the midst of the global pandemic of COVID, both having impact on the house ball community. I am a believer, though because of its marginal, its marginal position historically, that Baldwin literally has something to say, has something to teach about to the world about what it means to be human in the struggle for freedom in the face of catastrophe. It is absolutely the black church. Absolutely, the rebirth of a new nation. And like a black prophetic fire, it's a, it sees a way forward. It has a vision. It uses the social imagination to create the thing that is not there yet. I want to end with two things, two sentiments. To sort of codify in that which I was trying to talk about today. One is written by James Baldwin the other by an, a pioneer icon from the house ball community um, that sort of really captures this, 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 this fire, I think, that ballroom engages in this black prophetic. So James Baldwin said, and here we are, at the center of the ark, trapped in the gaudiest, most valuable and most improbable water wheel the world has ever seen. Everything now we must assume is in our hands. We have no right to assume otherwise. If we, and now I mean the relatively conscious blacks who must like lovers insist on or create the consciousness of the others, do not falter in our duty now. We may be able, handful that we are, to end the racial nightmare and achieve our country and change the history of the world. If we do not dare everything, the fulfillment of that prophecy recreated from the Bible, from the Bible and song by a slave is upon us. God gave Noah the rainbow sign, no more water, the fire next time. And this last sentiment comes from a pioneer icon in the house ball community that says, we, we really are. We really have to remember our own greatness, our own divine greatness. Yet the question remains, how have we evolved as individuals, as a community, as a collective, as a people whose creative gifts are shown and replicated across the globe all over this world? whose gifts have blessed this universe in countless ways, magnificent and brilliant, whose relentless efforts and tireless desires have made a way out of nowhere. And now, how do we evolve? In this moment and time when the universe is begging us to be and remember our own audacity, how do we raise the bar, create new standards in our loving, in our mobilizing, in our own individual and collective process of self-definition and self-determination? Through our coalition building, our community service work on the runway, on the catwalk, on the piers of New York against a landscape of a city where it all began and now finds itself across the globe. Ballroom, be clear, be real clear. Who we are is ballroom, beautiful. Ballroom rock stars, freedom fighters, radical scholars, revolutionary artists, the black church, God in motion. We are the universe enacting in its own magnificence. So Ken, you, you know what I meant to ask you, Ken, what I wanted for you to do for us tonight is for us to end in prayer. 
for you to pray. And then we're going to end with a special song from you as well, Kim. You know, you know, only friends, only only friends can tell somebody on the spot. I need you to pray. <laughs> All right, I think I'm unmuted now. Um, I'm going to share a prayer that I prayed a couple of weeks ago for our proctor uh, prayer. So just give me one second. <laughs> I want to be organic and I probably will, but that will get me on my way. As we prepare ourselves in this space to take all that we've listened to and take the community that we're in right now and be able to hear the voice of God, even in this moment, we recognize that we always come together to lift each other up in the midst of a world where there's not enough lifting of each other, we take this time to center out some moments just to ask God to help lift us up, amen. Eternal God, we marvel at your splendor and raise to praise your name as the day is still cool and we are being blessed with the gift of life. We thank you, God, that you we've made it another day's journey and we are indeed glad about it. God, we thank you for your mercy and for the grace that you bestow upon each and every one of us every day. We are careful not to take your name for granted and how you have even seen us in our rebellion to your will for our lives. You continue to love us, care for us, provide for us, and you never leave us nor forsake us. Eternal God. As we find ourselves in this month where the celebration of black music, the remembrance of our delayed emancipation and our queerness is celebrated all around, we pause in this moment thanking you for the ability to celebrate freedoms as black folks, as same gender loving black folks, as a people who will always be prepared to fight for things that have been done against us and for the things that have tried to take us under. We thank you, God, for the forefathers and foremothers who sacrificed their lives, in some cases, their livelihood, just so that we can enjoy the freedoms that we have today, always recognizing that we have not yet fully overcome. We realize that in this year alone, after much protest in 2020, that there has been a death of unarmed Black men. There's still been brutal murders of trans women of color and we have seen blatant disrespect for order and a grotesque celebration of chaos. But we pray now in this assembly for the state of our union as we live up to what we, what is dreamed and what has been imagined. And where we as black folk can, as kin folk can imagine uh, that once imagined excluded now we can reimagine ourselves as being counted and valued and celebrated for our contributions here. God, as a people of color, those of us that are LGBTQIA people of color, we are praying for spaces where we can truly belong. Places like ballroom that will serve the present age they're calling to fulfill. We pray for safe havens for our LGBTQIA folks. We pray for community of those that are experiencing homelessness and joblessness. We pray for those that have been admitted into menstrual institutions because of the pressures of life that have weighed down on them. God, we are praying for those that are dealing with addiction to crystal meth and other party drugs. We are praying, God, that as a community, we can recommit ourselves to our faith and faith spaces and leaders like Michael Roberson who will help us to help us celebrate who we are and be about the business of helping us heal and be thankful to be loved by God. And so God, as you love us, remove the negative voice in us that sometimes is too loud and drowns the voices of affirmation and wholeness. God, as you love us, deliver us from the works of enemies and people that mean us no good. God, as you love us, instill in us a joy for our lives, who you called us to be, and set us on our path to be who you created. God, as you love us, bring us into the company of people who will elevate our thinking and guide us toward a life in you. God, as you love us, prune the things from us that mean us no good. 
God, as you love us, pour into us strength and fortitude it takes to be SGL people in this world. God, as you love us, expand our hearts to love those that hurt us and teach them that the joy of true love, even if we have to walk away. God, as you love us, lift us, teach us, grow us, shape us in the image of you, loving and divine, created and full of joy. God, we are thankful for the ways in which you love us, in the ways in which your love has lifted us in the ways that you have continued to shroud us with your protection, even in times when it seems like we don't know where it's coming from, God, we know it's you. Because we recognize that you said in your word that you will never leave us nor forsake us. Now, God, for every word that has been spoken today, God, we ask that you would take these messages, bring them to your people, oh God, and help your people to understand that there is a place where they can go when their hearts are feeling downtrodden. There is a place that they can go, God, when they feel like they're not like all the others that are outside. There is a place they can go, God, when they recognize that there is something different about them than what's going on in the world. God, you wanna bring us to a place where we can be celebrated and used for all that we have, all the talents that we have, and we can glorify you with each and every one of those. It's in your ever most present name that we pray. Some call you Allah, some call you other names. I pray in the name of Jesus that you would hear this prayer now and forevermore. Amen. I say amen and a woman. I, I wanna say two things. Thank you, Ken, before you go into Psalm because nothing but the universe, God spoke to me through what you just said, but you just prayed. And to remember, if we think about a call to action, uh, back into 2010, my first semester at Union, um, again, one of the reasons why I called Dean Yvette Wilson Barnes, my rock at Gibraltar, um, one of my own sons in a kinship st structure way who lived with me for four years. Um, but as my first semester at Union, uh, was home with his partner. And they were watching the cartoon Happy Feet. And he went outside to take out the trash, came back upset about things. And him and his partner began to talk and it de-escalated. And he said, well, I'm going to go to bed and ask the partner to come with him. And his partner said, well, I'm going to finish watching Happy Feet. And I'll follow you later. The partner fell asleep on the couch and woke up the next morning hearing the alarm clock of my son. Um, and he called into the room and he goes into the room and my son had taken uh, hair clippers and shaved off all his, his facial hair and the hair on his head and hung himself from the ceiling fan. And he wrote on Facebook the night before, his name was Joseph Jefferson, I can no longer live in a world who's grown so cold to those who, who of us live out the social norm. This is my first semester at Union and I want to place that in dialogue and why in this moment, the call to action that not only do we celebrate all the differences and think about Orgy Lord, we also have to make a critique in love. Because at last year, at the, as the re-energizing, if you will, of Black Lives Matters around George Floyd's and police brutality over cis men's bodies, we also oftentimes had to realize that Black women get beat as well, but over George Floyd's body around the same area in the same geographical region, a in, in, in Minnesota, a trans woman named Ayanna Dior is getting beat in the store by about 30, 20 to 30 guys. They drag her outside the store and somehow she had a historical wherewithal to drag herself back in the store so that she could be filmed, so it could be filmed. Thinking about Mamie Till. So that as if to say that if I die, that the world over would see not just what happened to me, but what happens to women, black trans women like me all day, every day. I mentioned that because this notion of a, the rebirth of a new nation, that a critique has to be made around the whose lives matters most in Black Lives Matters if there's no, gonna, no outcry when these Black trans women continue to be beat and brutalized the same exact way. Last thing I say about that is that it's almost the laws of quantum mechanics 
the ideal of black freedom. I think about Dr. Cornel West who says, have we grown, we've grown old, but we haven't matured, right? That, that the, the most emblematic event around the black struggle for freedom post-slavery is in 1963 March on Washington, that an openly black gay men organized Bear Ruff. And then the most emblematic event around the black struggle for freedom post the March 1963 March of Washington is this moment now, Black Lives Matters, created by three black women, two of them black queer women. The ideal of being homophobic against the very people that God has brought your freedom through for the past 50 years makes no sense. That is called, that's absolutely called a plantation psychosis. Plantation psychosis. And so I bring that up because what, what Ken said, it laid on my heart that, in, that, that that is the call to action, that none of us are free until we all are free. So thank you, Ken, and we'll, we'll close with your beautiful selection. None of us are free until we are all free. Very song by Edward Hawkins, it says, give us this day our daily bread. You said you would provide all of our needs according to thy riches. I have but to ask then I shall receive. Goes on to say to go from here and share this love that you've given to me to show someone who's lost and help them find their way a way to truth, which is always good, and faith, for they shall be free, like me. Lord, we need your love. Lord, we need your peace. Lord, we need your joy this day. Give us this day. Our daily bread, you said you would supply all our needs according to your riches we have but to us and we shall share this love you gave to me to show someone who's lost and help them find their way the way to truth and faith so they can be free like me. Yeah.
gave to me to show someone who's lost and help them find their way the way to truth and faith so they can be free like me So Sandra, I don't know how y'all have ended this and stuff. You know, I'm a, I'm a novel at, at, at this. I, um, you know, can, um, first of all, watching, you, Sandra, you talked about the call and response, so watching you and Kimberly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I, I oftentimes tell, say that every time I go to speak, I look for black women. Cause they'll tell you whether you're doing good. Yeah. This is the move, or you're doing bad. Yeah. So, so watching you, and I do this intentionally because I'm trying not to cry because I don't do that in public. Um, so I just I, I say that to say I so appreciate your both of your spirits and, and being here with us, and uh, and again, Sandra, for you inviting me to be in this space. And and Ken, I love you. You know, I love you from the moment we met at Union in 2010. I will love you until the moon recycles itself. So, so that being the case, again, Ashe, amen, and a woman. Thank you so much. Oh my God, I can't even. And just so everybody knows, we tested the sound. Ken was doing you know, notes that I could not even imagine before we started and, and Zoom did do a, you know, took a couple down because, you know, Zoom wasn't ready for those incredibly holy sounds. Thank you so much. I am full. I am, I have been crying. I have been praising as I saw Sister Kimberly doing with me too. And just thank you so much. And as people have been uh, commenting on Facebook Live, Again, thank you so much. I I don't know what to say except thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you um, for you know just answering the call. Y'all obviously have, both have such ministries that are incredible, and I'm so grateful for your lives. Um, and you know, just please join us next Wednesday for our last pride uh chapel series it'll be drag chapel at 1 p.m next wednesday um but this oh my goodness i can't so thank you so much thank you so much and thank you all for joining us wait can they drop their social media or how can we contact oh, them to see where you speak you. again or minister again like we want some mo yep yep you're on mute you're on mute michael <laughs> so as Union opens up, I do so many programs. This is one of the beautiful things about I love. I meant to mention my great colleague, Robert Simber, who's my soulmate in this work, and thank my good colleague, Lisa Schufer, whose house I, I, I overtake to do these things. But I do so many programs at Union. Some of the, a lot of the ballroom initiatives were in many ways created. A couple of them were my thesis projects, but at Union. 
I was blessed enough for about three, four years, I'm gonna put back in Robin's ear that I teach a two day course there called the Trans Sounds of Black Freedom. Um, but I will give Sandra my email address. We're doing a whole bunch of things this, this, this summer and Ken's a pastor. Ken pastors a church, so. <laughs> I do pastor a church and you can always follow me at, uh, at Ken Alston Jr. Um, K-E-N-A-L-S-T-O-N-J-R um, on Instagram and on Facebook. Um, or you may follow my church at Elpida uh, Church 2010, E-L-P-I-D-A uh, Church 2010 um, on Instagram. Uh, we're doing some stuff. We're about to roll out some stuff. Uh, uh, Kimberly, I hope to see you in maybe one of our virtual services or one of our service when we finally come back. Uh, we're doing a new initiative where we're gonna celebrate the arts, um, the sacred arts uh, by using uh, sacred texts um, and allowing the, the artists to do with the sacred texts what needs to be done so that people can see it in a different way other than just preach word. Um, some things that I learned at Union. So uh, <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. looking forward to, uh, to that um, and hopefully you'll uh, be along with the journey with me. Thank you. Thank you all again. Trust, I'll be, you know, knocking on y'all's doors several times. Thank you so much. And Sandra, put in Robin's ears and Michael's going to send your email. That's <laughs> right. And you send it to me too, please. Okay. Of us. <laughs> okay. Thank y'all. Take care. Bye. Thank you for joining us.